Welcome back to Vantage. Uh, my next manager is someone who has grown up through the ranks, started as an analyst, is now co-managing uh, a number of portfolios. Um, one of the reasons I wanted her on is that she manages both growth and income. And at a time when we're debating value versus growth, I just thought it would be instructive. What you're finding, what you'll find is that you've got someone who is refreshingly honest. Let's go and take a look. Welcome back to Vantage. Uh, delighted to have Laura Foll, uh, Portfolio Manager with Janus Henderson here with us today. Uh, welcome to the show, Laura. Um, we'll go into your sort of career and background, uh, but before we do, uh, a fairly volatile first quarter in the market. Just wanted to get your take on um, the outlook and how you're positioning the fund in light of what we've seen. Yeah, it's definitely been challenging first quarter. I think first thing I'd say is that the way we run Lord Venture is we have 150 holdings. So we're not trying to run it in any sort of thematic manner. And while we think, you know, yes, there will be pressure on consumer incomes, certainly going into the second quarter and the second half as well, we will not be repositioning the fund mm -hmm. on that basis. I think if we're being really honest, it's too hard. You know, we can see this pressure on consumer incomes coming, but equally we can see that consumers have built up savings yeah. over the course of the pandemic. They might choose to draw down on them. They might not. It, I think the most likely outcome is that some households, unfortunately, will be relatively easily, you know, they can go through this period quite easy. Some definitely won't and will feel real, real pressure. It often ends up that there's this very uneven distribution. There are so many different factors that for us to say, okay, for you know, m and specifically or Halford specifically, this is what's going to happen. I just think it's too hard. And, and that area has already derated. And by that area, I mean consumer discretionary from the retail sector, you know, 25, 30 odd percent year to date. Yeah. So for us to be making those kind of calls now, I honestly think it's too difficult. And yeah. we just need to focus on on the stocks. You know, that's. I'd love to sit here and say, look, here's our outlook and here's how we reposition. I honestly just think it's too hard. You know, it's one of one of the more challenging periods that we face. And I think we just need to focus on, keep focusing on companies. I think that is realistically where we can add some value for the Lord Venture shareholders. Yeah, okay. And the hope is that, look, if you pick good quality companies, exactly. they'll ride the test of time, won't they? Exactly. So, yes, okay. There might be short term, I mean, there definitely will be short term fluctuations, but if we're talking three, five years, that's the type of time horizon we have for Lord Venture. We would like to think these companies can grow over that type of period. Okay. Talk us through your own background. So, um, you know, your entry into the fund management uh, industry, the range of funds that you work on. Um, and, uh, you know, the, if you can talk to, uh, to a little bit in terms of who those funds are best suited for from a layman's perspective. Sure. Yeah. It's not a particularly long CV. I joined what was Henderson, what is now Janice Henderson, in 2009, one of the graduate scheme. And I've been there ever since, <laughs> about 13 <laughs> years. That is literally my whole CV. Yeah. Um, and I worked with James, you know, I work alongside James Henderson. Um, again, that's been right from the beginning, really. I saw that James needed someone you know, working alongside him. We run four different funds. One of them's an open-ended fund. Three of them are investment trusts. The, the thing that links all of them is that they invest, they're all UK, more predominantly UK, and they invest across everything from AIM all the way up to the FTSE 100, and that's consistent across all four funds. Three of them have an income remit, one don't. If I was to give you a the 30 seconds on each of the trusts, you know, for Lord Adventure and for Lowland, they both sit within the UK equity income sector. And the differentiating feature of Lord Adventure is that it has the independent professional services business yeah, yeah. that provides roughly a third of the income. Mm -hmm. And that allows its investable universe to open up and we can hold lower yielding shares. Now, the equivalent for Lowland that opens up the investable universe is that it can hold a more significant weighting in small cap. We invest heavily on AIM, invest heavily on FTSE small cap. So in both of those funds, it's taking the UK income fund and trying to add something a little bit different. And what's different is different in both cases. Yeah. And then for HART, and what we call HART Henderson Opportunities Trust, it is quite different. It's a capital growth focused fund. It would have over 50% on AIM, and it would be trying to identify the companies in the UK that will be what we call tomorrow's leaders. But mm -hmm. what we mean by that is companies that can be substantially bigger in five, ten years time. You know, I, when I think of HART, I often think of it as the child ISA type fund where yeah. um, you, you hold this with a time horizon of 
I would say probably 10 years plus, and you hope that some of these companies that are on AIM will go on, hopefully, to be the FTSE 100 companies of the future. Some of them won't, yeah. but hopefully some of them will. And so that's, that's what HOT's about. Okay. So, I mean, the it, I guess with growth comes greater risk, and so you've yeah, got, you need that yeah. longer time horizon, whereas the income funds are for those who want security and is, is a good way of characterizing them. Exactly. Yeah. So it's for those that want their income for a, a hopefully a predictable income stream because we are trying to use the trust structure yeah. to its best advantage. You know, we've got revenue reserves in both cases that have allowed us during this period, you know, we all know that this has been a period of real dividend volatility. And in both cases, we've managed to, to grow the dividend throughout. And I think it's just about trying to use that investment trust structure to the best we can. Okay. We, you, you started by saying you'd not been particularly adventurous and you started as a graduate. Um, I'm not particularly adventurous, so we both went to the same school, the London School of yep. Economics, which is about 300 yards from here. Um, geographically, I haven't seemed to move very far from that. <laughs> that. Um, and you, you actually switched into your course at the LSE. You were doing something slightly more theoretical at Cambridge and then went to the LSE to study economic history. Having studied that i just wanted to get a perspective in terms of we, we've just had you know an unexpected invasion of ukraine impact the markets etc i don't know if there's anything that you draw on from i guess where you come from what you've studied in terms of um, what you think uh, lies ahead of us as a consequence i think so that's very good knowledge of my background by the way <laughs> <laughs> um, i think when it comes to economic history what it what it taught me i suppose is that the economy is operated by people mm -hmm. and so if you're thinking if you're trying to model it in a very precise way it often doesn't work the way you think you know yeah. what used to frustrate me about studying pure economics and why I switched is because you're, you're looking at these theoretical models and then at the end of the hour lecture you sort of say well was that how it worked in real life and then, oh no, no no it didn't really work and you think well what was the point of that then whereas economic history is about looking at what actually happened yeah and people are still trying they're still debating you know what caused the the great depression or what caused the industrial revolution you know, all this time later so the idea that we have this really precise understanding of economic models i always think well does it actually hold up in the real world because you're talking about real people making decisions and maybe it doesn't quite work out like that and i think the thing that strikes me most of, on that at the moment was the idea that the central banks could press a button and inflation would magically go back to the target. I think the idea that it can be that precise, to me, doesn't sound rooted in reality. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, with regards to Ukraine, as, as awful as it is, you know, if you're thinking about it from a purely economics perspective, I think it's going to prolong that period that inflation is higher. You know, more people will see that their wages aren't keeping up with inflation. Yeah. More people are likely to say, come on, next time they meet with their boss, I can't, you know, I'm struggling. Please help me. And it just becomes rooted. And it is people at the end of the day that drive that inflation number. So this idea of, oh, we raise interest rate 25, 50 base points and it all goes back to what was before. I think there's a risk. There's a real risk to that, that people change their behaviour. Yeah, OK. And now that's... that's um that's very insightful because we've had a, a number of people come on onto the show and I guess there is a debate out there. Is it, is it transitory or is it more uh, long-standing? And I think for me, it certainly feels like the pendulum swinging towards this is a long-standing issue that we're going to have to learn to, to, to deal with. Um, it's a good segue also into my next question, which is you talk about it's a people, um, uh, people who drive economies. Um, You've been co-managing a fund, <laughs> yes. and uh, so I would love to hear about the chemistry of the team, and in particular, you know, what happens when you and James don't share a view. I think anyone who um, who knows me and James or who's worked with me and James knows that we're not, you know, we're not sitting here fighting with each other all day long. We're both quite relaxed characters, and yeah. we're unlikely to have. I suppose it comes down to the fact that we're not running a 20 list portfolio. We're yeah. running a portfolio in Lord Ventures' case with 150 stocks in it. Yeah. So if I have a view on, you know, say Bristol Myers, you know, one of the pharmaceutical companies, and I say, look, whatever, it's on eight times earnings, I think it should be on 12. James is unlikely to sit there and argue with me for a day. He's probably more likely to say, okay, you know, you follow that sector closely. Let's start with a 30 or 50 basis points type position and see how it goes. That is 
much, much more likely to be the case. Okay. Or equally, if James says, you know, we've held Croda for 30 years, it's on whatever it got to, almost 40 times earnings, it's time for us to sell it. I am much more likely to say, yeah, I agree. Okay, let's move on. Uh, very, very rarely will we strongly disagree with each other. Yeah. Um, that, that genuinely is uh, the exception. And I think that just comes to, I mean, the real fact of it is James, James was the person that taught me. Yeah. <laughs> so we do think similarly about yeah. things because James is the one that you know, taught me how to analyse these things. So if we were to strongly disagree, that would be quite rare <laughs> because we're looking at things in a similar way. Um, but I think the structure of the fund means that we can both express our views and we have the chance to do that within 150 stocks. Okay. And um, I mean, what are the benefits of working alongside someone like James? So, uh, you know, you, you come across a lot of, you know, single managers and they focus on what they think is right when you're working with someone else. You've got someone else to talk to, someone yeah. else to bind. What, are, what do you find the benefits are? I mean, it was definitely, you know, we talk about people during COVID, it, the peak of COVID, I mean, you know, yeah. spring 2020. It was, it was a really challenging time. It wasn't something that either of us had ever seen before. You know, yeah. with, normally with James, I can phone him up and say, you know, what's, what happened last time interest rates went up? Or what happened in, in the financial crisis? And he can you know, give me a bit of historical context because he's you know, seen all of these cycles before and that's really, really helpful for me. When it came to COVID, neither of us had ever seen anything like that before. And it actually really, I found, helped that we had each other. I think it would have been a really lonely, difficult time to have been managing a fund if you were totally on your own. You know, so many companies were cutting dividends. At one point, so many companies were raising money. Yeah. You know, before the furlough scheme really kicked in and um, that that sort of buffer was there, you know, it was it was it was a scary time for some of the more cyclical companies. You always think there might be a recession we were never expecting a situation where you know the pub companies the bowling companies whatever literally had to shut their doors that was just never within our yeah. experience yeah. so it was really important i think that we had each other to talk to during that time phase <laughs> sort of, we had mental prop um but you know aside from those unique situations i think it's really helpful for me i've had a slightly strange experience where i've been here 13 years and only now we talk about interest rate rises yeah so it's great that I have James, who's you know seen all this before, and he can provide that context. Yeah. Okay. So um, you know you scour the universe, predominantly UK. Um, when you spot something that's either right for one of the income funds or the uh, the opportunity trust, can you walk us through the investment process in terms of you know how you get comfort and conviction that this is something that's right for us to put our clients' money into? Yeah. So a Lord of Venture. We so both me and James will have a very specific type of company in mind, and we both know what we're looking for. And I'm, I'll try my best to articulate, which mm -hmm. is that we're looking for companies that are at least one of the market leaders, if not the market leader. Yeah. And when I say that, I think people's minds often think of the biggest companies. You know, we used to hold Microsoft in the launch branch. I think people's minds often jump to the likes of Microsoft when I say market leader, but I also mean market leaders. In much smaller areas so for example we hold a position in you know Halfords which is the market yeah. leader in cycling retailing yeah. um, or something like Ready Northgate which is the market leader in white van hire mm -hmm. you know, they are still market leaders but they're not necessarily the market leaders that you would think of off yeah. the bat or maybe not consumer facing businesses that people wouldn't would know of so market leading uh, well managed and again sort of what do I mean by that I mean management teams that are just constantly thinking about the routes to growing, whether it's acquisitions that might fit or you know, a bit of extra R&D that they can spend, you know, hiring the right person, a bit of extra capex that they can spend on. It's just having that mindset of, okay, how can we grow? How can we grow? Um, because ultimately we are the number one thing that we are looking for as companies that have the potential to grow. I, I think it's which sometimes surprises people because we are quite value in, in how we approach things. But I think I honestly find it too hard to value companies where they're in decline. I think it's so easy to get that slightly wrong. Mm -hmm. um, whereas what we're looking for is companies that can grow, but where the market is missing something that we think you know, the market is thinking something is worse than it is. And that can be all sorts of reasons, you know, at the moment. The market almost seems to be against 
anything consumer facing. You know, at the moment, be something being out of favor could be as simple as it being a retailer. Yeah. Um, and almost that whole area is out of favor. But, you know, it could be all sorts of different reasons. But it's a company that's out of favor for some reason, market leading, well managed is what I when I think of broad venture, that's what we're looking for. Okay, so you found the attributes. What then, what else do you do? Do you read, you know, to go into the broker network and speak to them or do you meet the management team? What's your normal sort of follow-up process to that? We'd almost always meet the management team. Yeah. I would say that's much more important at the small and medium-sized company end mm -hmm. than it is at the large company end. Yeah. Um, so when, when I say always meet the management team, if, it, if it's Glaxo or yeah, okay. HSBC, I yeah. would put less emphasis on meeting the management team just because you think, well, this is the person at the top, but it might not be reflective of the next layer down. And with those huge, huge companies like that, they're the people that are really running the business day to day. But if it's, uh, you know, going back to that health as example, you know, I think it's very, very important for us to meet the management team or something like that. And that new management team in that kind of company would have been a big part of the confidence in, in that investment. So we would definitely meet the management teams. We would occasionally go on site visits where it's important. Um, but I would say, again, I probably don't need to go on a site visit to Glaxo yeah. or HSBC. I don't I don't quite see what, what that would add. So meet the management team, occasionally go on a site visit, definitely talk to brokers, but they wouldn't be necessarily the influencing factor in making that investment decision. Okay. All right. Um, the, the interesting, you know, we've had, you know, the first quarter where it seems like value is outperformed growth. And I know there was a sort of raging debate in terms of, you know, value versus growth. I know, and I've seen you on record saying it's not particularly helpful and it's not particularly black or white. And so, the, you know, the reason I'm asking you is that you do both, right? So I've got someone on the show who can uh, provide uh, you know, a, a view on that. And my curiosity is for the Opportunities Trust, do you approach it with the same mindset as you do for Lowland or Lord Adventure? I think in all cases we're looking for growth. Yeah. And actually even in HOT, there's a huge variety. So within Henderson Opportunities Trust, there's a huge variety of the growth rates of the companies in that fund. And HOT would also hold HSBC that would all, that yeah. would be in Lowland and Lord Venture as well, but it would equally hold you know, some of the fuel cell companies and you know the likes of Oxford Nanopore, yeah. where realistically the valuation of those type of companies requires clearly a lot more growth than the likes of you know, HSBC, GlaxoSmithKline. So it's about what level of growth do these companies need to deliver to justify the valuation, valuation that yeah. it's on. You know, for something like Oxford Nanopore to justify the type of valuation it's on, it needs to go on to be one of the market leaders globally mm -hmm. in DNA sequencing. And then it's about us deciding whether that's a realistic possibility or not. Okay. Um, so it, you know, we're always thinking about where's, where's the growth coming from across all these different companies, but the scale of that growth will need to be completely different for some of the smaller company valuations. For, the earlier stage smaller company valuations to yeah. be justified. Okay, interesting. Um, it looks like the outlook for income, so you know, you talked about the fact that dividends got slashed through the pandemic, and the outlook certainly looks like it's uh, improving for income. W what are the signs that you're taking comfort from? I would say it's been a good year. So 2022 so far, we've been pleasantly surprised by the amount of dividend growth that's coming through. And I think I think the reason for that is that a lot of companies reset their balance sheets in a positive way during COVID, and we're only starting now to see them being confident enough to return some of that to shareholders. So to give you a few sort of more specifics on that, you know, something like um, a DFS or a Headland, which is a carpet distributor. Mm -hmm. um, you know, these type, or Halfords is another good example. You know, these companies were I hate the words, but it was they they were pandemic winners in some cases. You know, the likes of Halfords, we we didn't want to get on the tube. We went and bought a bike. Yep. And it gave them that opportunity to when people previously and I think management would also admit the balance sheet was relatively geared pre COVID and it's not geared now. Yeah. You know, they, they they've really used that cash boost during the pandemic to to pay down debt. And I think what you've seen companies do now is say, Okay, Right, our balance sheet's been reset. It's been 
you know, 18 months or so, two years since the peak of that pandemic, we, we've probably had the confidence now to come out to, to do that share buyback, to maybe do a special dividend, to return to paying a dividend in some cases. So we've been, we've been pleasantly surprised. And I think if there was to be one trend that I've seen come through only in the last couple of months, it would be that companies are increasingly buying back their own shares. Yeah. Which I think, you know, we thought UK equities have been undervalued for quite a while. Mm -hmm. You know, we, along with lots of other UK fund managers, have been putting that case out there. And I think the fact that quite a few, you know, say, taking Lord Venture as an example, the likes of Direct Line, the likes of Bradley Northgate, uh, the likes of Emma G, are buying back their own shares in a material way. As the management team saying, we think our shares are undervalued as well. And we don't seem to be getting anywhere with just paying a dividend yield so we're going to go out there and buy back some of our own shares because it almost i think it's is the way the company management team's way of saying no one seems to be listening so we're just going to buy our own shares thanks yeah um and that's that's been a pretty clear trend over the last couple of months okay and it, 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 it was the next question i was going to ask you but i'll ask it in a slightly different way um you, you, so you're pitching effectively that the uk market is undervalued um, you know, I would sort of, we've seen a lot of sort of overseas private equity interest coming in, taking out UK companies that also goes on to support that. So validate that. One of the things, one of the features of the market that I've certainly seen is that, you know, with the outlook on inflation and rising rates, you've seen long duration stocks sell off. Um, is that, is there any nuance in that? So you, you talked about the consumer sector derating, the TMT sector has taken quite a quite a hit as well um when you're talking about uk market valuations are there other are some of the sort of long duration sectors still uh, looking cheaper or are still looking expensive what's what's the view on that you know i think if we were trying to pin down which bits of the uk market were the cheapest if you like so the uk equity market as a whole is mm -hmm. at a valuation discount and that's why you know for lord Ed, we have been net buyers of, of UK equities. So the UK as a whole is at a discount, whether that's on P or cyclically adjusted P. If, if you look beneath that, the area of the market that's on, we think the, the bigger discount is domestic UK equities. And that discount has really opened up in the period since since Brexit. You know, if we, if we wanted to be really blunt about it, it does seem like that is the trigger point for domestic equities derating. Um, now, it's interesting you talk about takeovers. I, I don't think we've seen a particularly concerted trend of the takeovers being in that area. Um, you know, again, for this for this portfolio of Lord Ebb, we've had Blue Prism, mm -hmm. um, which was, for, I always get these words wrong, robotic process automation software, yeah. um, which was bought by a US company. And then we've had the likes of RSA. Again, that was bought by a peer. We've had Megit. That was bought by a US company. So it doesn't, they weren't necessarily just domestic companies actually be the opposite um, but if you look purely on valuation alone you know, domestic equities have been very out of favor yeah um, you know, whether that's for you know, sterling it's obviously not gone back to the levels it was pre-brexit you know business investment has been low and i think you know, the, the real reason is just we haven't had we haven't caught a break you know we've had brexit and then all the political wranglings after that then we had the election then we had a couple of months relief. Then we had COVID. Yeah. And then we had seemingly a couple of months relief. And now we have a war. Yeah. And it just, there hasn't been a period where UK equity, domestic equities can show that there's some perfectly good businesses here that can be cash generative, that can grow you know, modestly. Probably not, they're not Microsoft, but they can grow modestly. So you need that period of, of just steady growth for them to be able to show that they, they are capable of growing you know, in, in that modest way. Okay. Um, I think you'd outlined um, some of the attributes you're looking for in companies. So, you know, market leading positions, you know, you avoid sunset companies, good quality management teams who are clearly identifying a pathway to growth. And then there's there's buying in at reasonable value. Um, can you and you, you've touched on some examples, but I wondered if you could might, might sort of walk us through one or two examples of things you've recently added to the portfolio that's met that that met the current criteria and explain why sure um so one new position for lord Herb, it's, it's roughly a percent of the portfolio now would be kingfisher mm -hmm. um i think most people listening would be familiar with it but just in case you know it owns the likes of being q 
also own screw fix. Yeah. So if you think about what I was saying, we were looking for you know, market leading. You know, yes, it's definitely market leading in the UK in terms of DIY retailing. Um, well managed. Um, yeah, I think the new management team of Kingfisher are doing a much better job. Yeah. Um, you know, some of their problems in France were self-inflicted, to mm. be honest, in mm. terms of them losing market share, you know, duplicate costs, a bit of a mess up with what they called one Kingfisher, which was basically trying to have the same products in different geographies. And actually the DIY market is quite regional. And yeah. you, need to yeah. get, you need to just give people what they want. Yeah. And they, the old management team, I think, slipped up a bit on that. So I, I do think it's much better managed. And in terms of what people are missing, you know, that point of, of negativity, I think it was, again, you know, like Halfers, it was one of those pandemic winners, Kingfisher, where, you know, we were trapped at home, we were all working from home, we spent more money on our own houses. And there is this perception that that will reverse. And to be honest, I don't know if it will reverse. But the fact is that analyst numbers assume it does, which I always think that's a nice place to start. If you're starting from a point where analysts are factoring in like for like sales growth going backwards that always makes me smile a little bit because you think yeah that might happen or it might not and if it doesn't you might have a bit of scope for earnings upside there yeah and you're starting from a point where you know well where it is now it's on in theory less than 10 times earnings now clearly those earnings are dependent on what the consumer does right now you know going right back to that point at the beginning i don't know if the consumer just draws back a little bit or chooses to use some of their savings. I don't know. But um, you're starting from a point where it looks lower value than it has been, um, well, lower value than the market and lower value than it has been in recent years. Clearly, there might be some short-term volatility. We don't know. Um, but that's the kind... So Kingfisher is the kind of thing that, you know, putting all those three points together, we thought, yeah, that seems like a, a Lord Venture type of holding. Uh, you know, it fits all of those attributes. Pays a perfectly decent dividend yield while we wait. Um, so that's that's a, a new holding that kind of ticks those boxes. I think another one, well, not I think, another one um, that we've bought recently would be Beckett Bankiza. Mm -hmm. um, that's been bought within the last six months or so. Again, just under a percent position. It's not huge. Yeah. You know, the Lord Venture doesn't tend to run huge active weight positions. It does tend to be quite conservative in that respect. With Reckitts, what made us take that position is it seems to be improving. You know, going back to we want companies that can grow. In the last couple of quarters, the organic sales growth seems to be ticking up. Yeah. And the management have been reinvesting heavily for quite a few years now in um, sales and marketing, you know, trying to get that organic growth engine moving again. And it seems to be having an effect you know, beyond just people getting more cold again. You know, there, there does seem to be something behind it. Um, and the consumer staples as an area, well, a bit like consumer discretionary is now, consumer staples as an area had, has been quite out of favour. You know, it had a difficult year last year yeah. um, with margins coming under pressure because of all the input cost pressures that we all know about. Um, so it had debated and we thought that gave us what could be an interesting opportunity. So even, you know, 13 years of fund management, um, one of the things I found working in, in finance um, is it, it can be intangible but actually if you start to understand that you know what you're doing is providing companies with access to capital to help them grow and that leads to employment and that leads to you know them paying their taxes and funding public coffers it's it's actually you know it's, it's one of the sort of things i tell young people joining our business is that you you do make a difference i think it's one of the most rewarding things is actually being able to advise be in a position to advise and guide um any examples where you know you you know as a steward as a, a shareholder effectively companies have turned to you and and asked you for your views on things? It does happen from time to time. I would say I don't want to overplay it. Yeah. Because I think the reality of it is, we're fund managers. We're shareholders at the end of the day, mm -hmm. and these managers are out there on the ground running the business day to day. So I wouldn't. I, I think we're quite careful to not not try and overplay our hand you know, realistically there will always be an information asymmetry with them knowing their own business better i think where we can offer some types of advice is we meet a lot of companies we see companies you know succeed and fail and there are you know some lessons that can be drawn across sectors 
I mean, what I find myself saying to companies most often is under promise, over deliver. Yeah. Because there is so much focus, I would say more than ever, sometimes frustratingly, on earnings momentum in the market. And if a company can continue every time they report to say, we did what you expect and a little bit more, if you can keep doing that over and over again, I, I, I see shares re-rate to sometimes surprising levels, but the opposite is also true. If you if you miss earnings expectations, even by a little bit at the moment, because sentiment is always, already bearish, then the share price response is, is just brutal. It really is. Yeah. So if you can do... I have some companies that I see as almost persistent offenders where they, they do the opposite, they overpromise, and that has been treated... Um, you know, very harshly. So if we can really drill that in, yeah. then, then I like that. I suppose the other thing I'm saying to companies a bit at the moment is, is that point around share buybacks? You know, if, if a company is already trading at, say, an 8% dividend yield, and has been for a while, and doesn't seem to be being any, given any credit for that, then they say to me, shall I do that special dividend or should I do a buyback? I'll tell them to do a buyback because they just, there hasn't been that net buyer in size in UK equities that has allowed these companies to re-rate. So I think sometimes companies have to be their own net buyer. Just you know, And that's quite disappointing, but I think we just have to be pragmatic about it at this point, and we just haven't seen the flows in UK equities. So I think you know, sometimes it has to, you have to do it for yourself. And, and I think hopefully, um, but so far, actually, that seems to be working quite well as a strategy. Companies yeah. going out and buying their own shares. Okay. Um, let's wrap up on a couple of uh, what I call human interest uh, questions. Firstly, so what's the most memorable site visit you've been on? Um, okay, so I've been on a couple. I think my most memorable one, just for my own stupidity, was I went to a site visit for Hillensmith, mm -hmm. um, which is a, oh, it does a couple of things, but among other things, it's a galvanizer. Um, so huge zinc baths, you dip in bits of metal so that they don't corrode. But we're talking you know, huge molten metal bars. And I knew this was what I was going to visit. Um, but anyway, it didn't stop me turning up in a sort of dress, no tights, ballet flats on this huge construction site. And you could just see them thinking, oh, come on, you know, bare legs, sort of spitting molten metal. Yeah, it was, that was not my finest, uh, not my finest hour. Um, but I remember it. <laughs> um... And, you know, a lot, a lot, one of the reasons I do uh, these interviews is that I think, you know, we're, it, a large part of the purpose is to educate people. Um, you've made the transition uh, from an analyst to fund manager. Um, if you're, you know, about to talk to someone about to graduate from around the corner um, and who's looking at got an interest at looking at the fund management industry, what one or two key pieces of learning would you share with them? Uh, so... In terms of who would be suited to being a fund manager, so if there's anyone watching thinking, could, could this be for me? I'd say maybe some people would disagree. I don't think you can be a perfectionist if you're a fund manager. Mm -hmm. I think, and the reason I say that is it can be quite soul destroying at times. You can do as much work as you want, get as comfortable with the company as you want, and be very wrong. Whether that's something that you've analysed wrong or just external events, whether it's COVID, whether it's yeah. war, you know, whatever it is. But you can, you can, and you will get things very wrong, and you can, to a degree, learn from that. But you'll still get things wrong. Of course, you will. Everyone gets things wrong, and materially. So, um, if I think if you're a perfectionist, that would be very difficult. I think you have to be the the sort of person that can say, okay, that happened. I just need to move on. Otherwise you know, for the duration of a career, you'll be constantly just beating yourself yeah, over it. Yeah. Um, so I think that's sort of a, a bit about the type of person. I think in terms of a lesson, you know, you have to be the, a jugg a constant juggler. You know, I'm learning about, you know, that galvanizer one minute and Halford's the next. And the first thing I ever looked at was a salmon farmer. <laughs> you know, you have to be willing to learn about all sorts of weird and wonderful things yeah. and find that interesting. I find that interesting. Um, but not everyone would. I think sometimes my husband looks at me and like, please stop talking. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I find it interesting. Um, but yeah, you have to be the type of person that really wants to learn and that will happily sit with a company that makes 
you know, window frames, whatever it is, and sit there for two hours and learn about window frames and come out thinking, oh, that was really interesting. Um, but again, that's not for everyone. Thank you. Uh, so look, um, you, you know, we've, we've had lots of managers come on, on, on the show. Um, there's definitely been a little bit of entertainment through the conversation, quite a lot of education, particularly I, I, I find, you know, a very simple way of picking stocks in terms of things that you identify the process you go. But more than anything, I think what comes across is a refreshing honesty, you know, that, that we are fallible. That, that you know that, that we're not going to get everything right and that there's some things we can't look into the future and predict and uh, i'm very very grateful for you to be for you being so open about about that laura fold thank you so much for coming on vantage thanks for having me